Welcome back to Coffee with Crav. So go grab your coffee, grab your orange juice. It is election day. Maybe you want to get something a little bit stiffer. I don't know. Or you might want to wait to, for the results later. I don't know. But uh, go grab something and uh, uh, we're going to begin now. So for those of you that have not viewed uh, Coffee with Crav in the past, we, what I'm doing is I'm interviewing different people from different walks of life uh, to provide interesting information, timely information, educational information, and have a little fun with it as well. Uh, and today, today is very, very timely. It is election day. There is uh, emotions that are very, very high. We have high anxiety. I don't know if you remember the movie, High Anxiety with, uh, with Mel Brooks, but there's a lot of high anxiety out there. And, and we're very, very fortunate today to have an expert on behavioral finance that will put these emotions that we're all having into perspective. So today we have Bob Schmidt and Bob oversees project research and analysis development of publications and presentations and special events for Brandis Institute, a division of the firm that, that seeks to develop ideas and research to expand the investment community's understanding of market behavior and portfolio management. He's also a part-time lecturer in the Master of Finance program at Raddy School of Management at the University of California in San Diego. Mr. Schmidt's role prior to joining Brandis include a head writer at Nicholas Applegate Capital Management, Associate Vice President at Weston Financial, editor at PRN Newswire. Mr. Schmidt earned a BA, magna cum laude, uh, and also an MA uh, from California State University, San Marcos. His relevant experience back in 19, goes back to 1990 and he joined Brandis Investment Partners in 2000. Bob, you have a very impressive background. And I know pre-COVID you went around the world making presentations on behavioral finance. For anyone out there that doesn't know what behavioral finance is, can you give an overview? Can you tell us uh, what it is and why it's so important? Yeah, well, first, Mark, thanks very much. And, and thanks everybody for watching. Um, yeah, taking a step back, behavioral finance to me is simply the science of decision-making. So a lot of what we'll talk about today, I think you could apply to any decision, but I'll, I'll kind of bend it around to address investment decision making. And it's important because we need to be aware of some of these missteps that we're all, um, we all succumb to at times, so we can address them, correct them, and then also exploit those missteps in other investors. So hopefully we can, we can talk about that a little today. Okay, well, um, let's talk about missteps and let's talk about mistakes. I'm going to bring us back to 2000, early 2000. I got a phone call from a CEO of a prominent company. And he said, Mark, I want to buy Cisco. Now, for those of you who don't remember, Cisco was the number one company in the world, the largest market cap in the world. Uh, Cisco was trading at over 70 times earnings, very, very high price earnings ratio. The stock was very hot. The technology was very hot. NASDAQ was very hot at the time. And it was going up every day. I said, Mark, I want to buy Cisco. And I said, you know, what, why do you want to buy it? And he said, well, because it's going up. I said, well, besides the fact that it's going up, it's trading at 70 times earnings, I would not recommend buying Cisco at this time. He said, no, no, I, I want to buy it. Anyway, we had a back and forth conversation, we wound up not buying it. I got a call two weeks later, stock was up, I don't know. 10, 15%. Ah, I should have bought it. We've been up 10, 15%. I don't know why you told me not to buy it. I should have bought it. Well, I'm going to fast forward. He never bought it. I'm going to fast forward a period of time after that, a couple of years after that. Cisco lost 70% of its value. Can you talk about something like that? Why people make those kind of mistakes in, in terms of right. investing or potential yeah, that, mistakes? That's, that's a great example. And at, at the time, I was working at uh, Nicholas Applegate, a growth stock firm. So we actually owned Cisco for a number of years and it migrated in the portfolios from small cap to mid cap to, to large cap. But in that situation, there's a, a number of behavioral biases at work. The, the biggest one to me is extrapolation, right? We, we, we see something happening 
and we just assume that what's happening is going to continue into the future or accelerate. And for a while, it worked with Cisco. And as we often say in the industry, it, it worked right up until it didn't. So I would really encourage every investor to constantly evaluate two variables when investing. That's the price of an asset and, and the underlying value of that asset. So housing crisis is another great example where just because housing prices are increasing, it's attracting attention, it's attracting investors, pushing those prices up further. But at, at some point, when the prices get so high, they're so disconnected from the fundamentals, often you see a correction. And it's really hard as it's happening in the short term to not jump on board. So extrapolation, there's also hurting, which is going on you, and you don't wanna be left out. You, you look around and everybody else is making money and, and, and hey, I'm, I'm, I'm missing out on this. But it's, it's really important in those moments to take a step back and focus on the fundamentals and, and focus on your, your process. And that example, it also brings up this, this whole dichotomy sometimes between investing and speculating. And I always look at investing as long-term, thoughtful, methodical, and speculation akin to gambling. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned about um, real estate. Are you talking about real estate right now? Because real estate pricing, especially in the uh, New York area, has been moving up. Or are you talking about back in 06, 07, when real estate prices were, were moving up? Both. Both. It, it's, it's really tough. And, and now, yeah, I mean, I'm out here in San Diego. But um, from what I understand, uh, in, in many parts of the country, people are moving out of cities, right? This is a, a COVID response, and I want to get into the suburbs. So it's pushing prices for these homes up much higher. Now, a lot of that appreciation to me then depends on the severity of COVID. And if we can get this under control, uh, maybe it opens up the real estate market back in, in the cities. So it, it's a big variable, but there might be opportunities to buy real estate in cities that are at lower prices versus in the suburbs. I, and again, I, I would just look at the price you pay versus the, uh, the underlying value of the asset. Okay. Um, I, I have a question about, uh, I'm really interested in your opinion on, on media. Um, mm -hmm. I remember in the dark days of 2009, February of 2009, where um, CNBC was always talking about how bad the market was. And remember, we had a market that peaked at 2007 and in February of 2009 was, was, was down incredibly. And CNBC had the highest viewership ever in February of 2009. And the low of the market was, I believe, March, eighth or ninth. Mm -hmm. So right before the very low, CNBC had the highest viewership. And CNBC was bringing on all these bears, all this bear, they bring all these talking heads in there to talk about how bearish it was. And that fueled the fire here. So um, I, I'd like to know what, you know, and they were doing obviously because of ratings. Um, I, I like to know what you feel about the medium and, and, <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, this is, we could probably talk about this a long time because I started off my college career as a journalism major. So the, the notion of kind of like price and value, the facts versus opinions, I'm, I'm really old school on this. And I get so disappointed today when I watch the news that the facts and the opinions tend to, to blur quite a bit. And there's a couple of biases that I worry about with the media. One is, is confirmation bias. And as the name suggests, you know, we have an idea in mind, um, and then we go out to do research on it. And with the internet, with blogs, with different media outlets now blasting news 24 hours a day, I'm certain that everybody can find a, a so-called expert who will support their view. That's not research. Research is, again, being thoughtful and rational looking at the pros and cons, and most people don't do that. So the, the media can be great in exacerbating those short-term emotions that we're feeling. So the market's down, right? They got all these bears on there and people get so nervous. And when the market is up, you might have all these experts who are saying, oh, the market's gonna continue on this, this rampage. It's, it's so hard 
to keep in mind that, that markets tend to be cyclical. So Buffett said, right, be, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. I think that that advice really holds true, again, for long-term investors. So I urge people to be really cautious about what you watch on TV. And unfortunately, during COVID, during various stages of, of lockdowns, you know, we're in our homes, we're working from home, the, the TV is right there. And too often, I think that can really fan some of those, those short-term emotions and it can drive our investment decision-making. And we really shouldn't do that. So it sounds like, Bob, what you're saying is that instead of watching media, you should be watching Coffee with Craft, right? <laughs> I think, uh... Well, on, on that front, I think it's, <laughs> it's vital to have an objective third-party professional that you can talk with about hey, I read this article in X. I saw something on the news. You know, what do you think of that? Mm -hmm. So you can avoid some of that confirmation bias. And, and some people are, are good at it. I would argue that most people aren't. And it's, it's because of the way our brains are wired. And, and I want to talk just a little bit about this notion of system one and system two thinking, because mm -hmm. there's been a ton of research that focuses on how we make decisions. And to oversimplify this, there's two pathways in our brains. And scientists argue this system one thinking is really emotional thinking. So if I said, let's do a little word association, think about food. If I said peanut butter and jelly, jelly just might right. jump to mind. That's not really thinking. That, that's more an emotional gut level reaction to something. That's system one. System two is the more thoughtful part of our brain. That's, that's the part that we engage the prefrontal cortex when we really need to analyze something. So the examples that I use, you know, if I were to cheat on my taxes, if I were to try and talk my way out of a speeding ticket, not that that ever happens, but I'm engaging a different part of my brain. So system one thinking will, will often kick in and it's, it's really in those moments where you should say, hey, Mark, I saw something. Can, can we talk about this a bit? Just let me, let me vet this with you. I, I think that can help dampen some of those emotional tendencies that, that we all have. So I think that we all would like to know how to get out of a traffic ticket. So uh, why, don't we, uh, <laughs> why don't we explore that? <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I've done it twice and I told the truth both for both times. Wow. I think the officers really appreciated that. Oh, very nice. Well, that's, uh, that's unusual. Um, okay, well, so uh, just kind of putting that into perspective. So let's say that I have a bias or I I see Tesla going up all the time. Yep. It's a big split going up all the time. And, you know, I just, I just want to buy it. So I go on the internet and I look up different articles and I look for the articles that say Tesla's going to go up a lot. So right. now I've had confirmation bias because I've looked on the internet. Yes. The internet has now confirmed that. Correct. Now there are other articles that say it's going to go down, but I, I ignore that. I go, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. So that's that's really what you're yeah. talking about yeah. with, with confirmation yeah. bias. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's really insidious because confirmation bias kicks in often at a subconscious level. So we're not even aware that we're looking for information that confirms what we believe. And a, a great example of this, and I use this example when I teach, is the devil's advocate. So I've tried to disconfirm this and I haven't heard anything that, that counters it, but it comes from the Vatican. So as they were selecting popes over the centuries, a consensus would emerge among the cardinals. So, hey, we, we're gonna nominate Mark to be the next pope, okay, Pope Mark. But then they would also ask a smaller group of cardinals to research why Pope Mark should not be pope. So advocate on behalf of the devil, you know, what, what are his flaws? And if a candidate survived that vetting process, then they could move forward confidently. So that, that whole notion of arguing the other side, looking for information, actively looking for information that counters what you believe, I think is really healthy to come up with a balanced view to make a better investment decision. I, I, I like that idea, except, um... I think my rabbi might be a little pissed <laughs> off if uh, I became the Pope. Uh, um, are there any big biases now that investors should be aware of? Anything that we should uh, 
it, 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 it? Yeah, extrapolation I would put in there, um, confirmation bias. Um, framing is another one, just, just how we look at things. And the classic example, the, the glass, if it's half full, what, what, what are we focusing on? Because earlier this year when, when the market was so volatile, people really zeroed in on that and the day-to-day -day ups and downs of the market. And we heard the term unprecedented so frequently. <laughs> With Absolutely. a longer term perspective, like this is not unprecedented. The market has seen these, these wild swings day-to-day -day numerous times in the past. So if you're just framing it in terms of what's happening now, it feels catastrophic. If you can broaden your horizon and, and, and frame it over a longer term, it was really natural. And, and we might see more of that volatility going forward. But again, in, in the short term, it could be a great opportunity to rebalance, could be a great opportunity to, to buy some things where the prices are down, avoid some things where the, the prices have, have risen a lot and, and focus on, on the long term. And, and your, your example about Tesla, again, that distinction between investing and speculating it might be fun to speculate a little bit. You know, maybe there's a portion of your portfolio that you're going to allocate to kind of fund money, and I just want to play the market. But that should be a very small percentage. You know, longer term, you need to be very thoughtful about where you're putting your money and why. Yeah, no doubt. I, I just want to remind everybody that if you do have a question, and we'll try to get to everybody's question, if you do have a question, email it to me. I have uh, my email up. So email it to me. My email is mkravitz, K-R-A-V-I-E-T-Z, at align, A-L-I-N-E, wealth.com. So if you have a question for Bob, please feel free to uh, send that over. Um, Bob, I want, to, uh, I want to look at risk and reward. Um, I talk to clients a lot about, it's kind of like a tightrope walk between risk and, and reward. Um, you know, you want to get the most amount of reward, but you got to take more risk. You want less, less risk, but then you're going to have to deal with less reward. Um, there's a couple of charts, I think, that emphasize this point. So I'm going to share my screen here so that you can talk through this. Yeah, just as, as you bring those up, Mark, the, the one thing with the media, again, they're so focused on price movements, which is very system one. Again, system one being that emotional thinking. And I, I've rarely heard a TV news anchor say, well, prices in the stock market are down, you know, the Dow's down 2,000 points a day or whatever. Now may be a great time to buy. Of course, you should talk with your advisor about your risk tolerance, your asset levels, your income needs, your long-term goals. You know, they, they never mention any of that. They just want you to focus on the price movements to, to fan that emotion to keep you tuning in. So uh, the notion, again, of, of talking with an objective, rational third-party professional, I can't underscore how important that is. So yeah, this, this is a great little chart on the, no, the, the relationship between risk and reward. So we put risk level on the horizontal x-axis from low to high, and then your potential return on the y-axis and often when you ask people, what's the relationship between risk and reward, they will say, and they've been trained, the more risk I take, the more return that I get. Now, if that were true, if you always took more risk and always got more return, it wouldn't be very risky. So that's classic system one thinking. And I love this illustration because it shows really the relationship between the two variables. So on the far end, a low risk investment, your range of returns is very narrow and it's positive. As you start to take on more risk, the potential to make money goes up, but the potential to lose money is also introduced. And then at the far right, a really high risk investment, you have the chance to make a lot of money, but you could lose it all. So I think this is a much more thoughtful way of looking at again, the relationship between these two vital variables when we invest. The only thing that's missing from this, and, and this is the theory, is time. If you add time to this illustration, it literally turns it upside down. So we looked at returns for what investors often think of as a really risky asset class, US stocks, going back to 1928. So here we've got ranges of returns 
for two rolling two year periods, rolling five year periods, 10 year out to 30 year. And as you can see far left over rolling two year periods, the range of returns was almost 60% on the upside, almost 60% on the downside and that's annualized. So over any two year stretch, you could see this huge swing in returns, but the longer you're invested, that, that range gets tighter and it gets positive. So I, I think this is a great way of showing the importance of focusing on the long term. And if, if people understand this, the, the, the follow up question that I would ask is the longer you're invested, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, what's the likelihood that you'll see one of these really bad two year periods? Does that likelihood go up or does it go down? And it goes up. So all of those bars, the five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year numbers includes all of the two year periods that roll into that. So the longer you're invested, the greater chance you're gonna see some short term volatility. But if you can hang in through that, even rebalance into it, as prices are falling. You know, imagine if you had rebalanced into the market in March when it felt horrific. And if you watch the news, everybody was calling for the end of the world, how much better you'd be off today. So I, again, I think this is a, a different way of, of looking at, at risk and reward and, and kind of reflects our system one, system two thinking. System one would say, yeah, more risk is, is more return. This is a little more thoughtful system two focused. So system one up here and system two, as you think through it, yeah. the longer that you have investments in the stock market, the less risk that it looks like it, that you're, it, you're, you're taking and the better the returns. Yeah, yeah, and, and risk, again, the, the media academics often define risk as short-term price volatility. And, and not to get too technical, that, that was a variable that was easy to use as a proxy for risk, but it really isn't. I mean, if you've got a long-term horizon, to me, the biggest risk is not meeting your investment goals. That that's you know. Do I you need to try any? Do you need to try it anymore? Uh, no, we we can take okay. that one away. But you know, if, if you want to put your grandkids through college, you know, and not being able to do that—that's the risk that that you face, not the day-to-day -day, uh, vagaries of of price movements. But it, it's so hard to to maintain that long-term focus again when the media is pounding on it, when your heart is racing, when some of these biases are kicking in and, and driving you to make poor decisions. And, and not always. I mean, one of the biggest things I wanna stress with behavioral finance is we as investors don't make mistakes consistently. It's just, we make them sometimes. And again, they're so insidious that we're not often aware of the missteps that we're making. And again, if, if we are aware, if we work with somebody who can help us through these things, we can take advantage of other people's missteps because somebody's on the opposite side selling you that stock when the price has plummeted and you can pick it up at a bargain price and, and hold on to it and make money. So what you're saying is it's nice to have a buffer between yourself and your money and your emotions that someone that doesn't have the same emotion that you have can take a logical look at whatever's going on yes. and help make the decisions there. Yeah, because a lot of investing is, is pretty simple you know, diversify, buy and hold, but it's not easy. And it's really these emotional biases, these, these tendencies that we have that, that make it really hard. I'm, I'm going to pull us away from investments for a second. We'll get back uh, to that. Uh, but how does major life events affect all of us? Uh, an example, a death of a loved one. How does that affect us? Yeah, and, and this, this, that's a perfect question. It ties back to, again, the, the media not understanding your personal circumstances. So, and it brings up another bias, something called the planning fallacy, where we as, as human beings are notoriously poor at estimating how much time, effort, money it's gonna to take to reach goals. And, and there's, the, the big construction projects are, are great examples of that. Um, I was tracking the, the, the new the new-ish Berlin airport. You know, it's years behind schedule, way over budget. You know, that, that's a classic example of, of planning fallacy. But with your personal investing, yeah, we should all be looking out 
into the future. So earlier I mentioned, okay, putting your grandkids through college, you know, how much money am I going to need in 10, 15, 20 years? Where are my kids going to be in 10, 15, 20 years? How old am I going to be in 10, 15, 20 years? So really looking at all of those things and saying, okay, how, how can I invest for each of those? And a, a death is a huge event that we need to plan for very thoughtfully, you know, whether it's estate planning, taxes, and then the emotions that are, are tangled up with that. And if you want, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that um, a little bit. Yeah, please, go ahead, please. It just, just you know, as, as background, when I was in my 40s, I'm 52 now, when I was in my 40s, I had lost everybody in my immediate family, both parents, two siblings, all my grandparents. And in many cases, I was providing care for the people in my family as they were dying and then grieving their loss and providing care for somebody else as he or she was, was dying. And it was some of these behavioral biases that helped get me through that, like extrapolation. The, the grief that I was feeling, I just assumed at the time would continue forever. And, and maybe as a guy, you know, we, we want to fix things. And I felt, well, I can't bring my sister back. I can't bring my dad back. So I'm never going to feel differently. This feeling, the, the anger, the sadness, the frustration, that's going to continue forever. But what I found was with time and with effort, my perception of their loss changed. I was more accepting of it. And the circumstances didn't change. You know, they're not coming back. But as my perception changed, my experience of their passings changed. And that, that, was, that was huge. So the notion of extrapolation and then prospect theory. And, and I want to talk a little bit about um, prospect theory. And this, this won Danny Kahneman, a Nobel Prize in economics years ago. Pretty amazing because Kahneman is not an economist. He's a psychologist. But basically, he argued that losses hurt twice as much, at least twice as much as comparable gains feel good. So you lose $100,000 in the market. You get that $100,000 back as the market goes up. You're even. But emotionally, you may not feel even. You may feel like you still lost money because that really, really hurts. Right. So we, we've got some tools about prospect theory. But as I was thinking about this during the grieving process, I was like, wow, OK, if, if losses, if losing money hurts two times as much as gaining a comparable sum, how, how does it feel when you lose a family member, when you lose a friend? You know, that, that's really got a way on you. And understanding prospect theory gave me a path to say, okay, I've got to do a lot of things on the other side. I need to focus on what makes me feel good, whether it's travel or playing golf or spending time with friends or music, whatever, and being really intentional about doing these things to help me feel better. That, that really helped kind of balance things out and, and, and get through those, those losses. Did, so, did, you feel, did you feel guilt? though because you just had these losses and now you're golfing or you're doing other things did you did you feel guilt like how could i go and 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 play golf when i just lost you know uh, a sibling or that's a great question and and not not really i i felt that survivor guilt you know like hey you know why did my sister die of, of colon cancer at, at 46 you know and, and and i'm still around um but but no i, I was i was really focused on i've, I've got to do these things for me. And then I, I volunteered at um, a hospital here in San Diego. And we'll never forget, there was an orientation. And the guy was asking, like, who's the most important person in your life? And these people are saying, you know, my, my wife and, and my mom or my grandmother. I'm thinking like, man, I, I don't have, you know, any of those folks in my life anymore. And I realized, like, it, it sounds selfish, but I felt like I'm the most important person. And, and not from a selfish perspective, but if, I, if I'm not balanced, if I'm not healthy, I can't take care of the people around me. So I need to keep myself healthy, whether that's mentally, emotionally, financially, so I can give love and care and support to the people who are close to me. So yeah, I did that very intentionally and didn't feel guilt in that sense. Like, yeah, I'm going out to golf and, and I should be grieving. It was, I'm still grieving and, and this is helping me through that. Okay, great. And, and listen, thank you so much uh 
for for sharing that. I really, sure. and I think everybody out there is, you know, really, really appreciates that. Sure. Um, this might be a good time to share the screen again. Uh, we can look at the wheel of emotion, investor yeah. emotions, because we're talking about emotion. So yeah. let me uh, let me share the screen here. Yeah, and th this whole notion of of prospect theory is is so so important. And 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 once you you understand how much the losses can weigh on us, then I, I think it helps us see through some of the um, the, the the short term um, losses and 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 stay focused on on the long term. So, what we created at the institute was this thing called the wheel of investor emotion. And basically, if you had this awesome portfolio that went up 15% a year, had like a 10% standard deviation, so not much fluctuation in the prices, over the long term, it would do really, really well. But, but if you looked at the performance of that portfolio every minute, every hour, every second, you'd be 50%, there's a 50% chance that you would see a loss. And when you see that loss, even in this phenomenal portfolio, again, you're, you're gonna feel miserable. So one of the things we realized was to help investors focus on the long term, you shouldn't look <laughs> at your performance day to day, hour to hour. And again, with, with computers, with your smartphones, we can all do this. It, it's so accessible right now but it's not good for long-term investing. So we, we created this wheel of investor emotion and the stats that I just shared about this hypothetical portfolio are what's featured here. So Mark, thanks for pulling this up. If, if you look at it every day, like if you rotate this thing back to daily, 54% chance of seeing a gain, but that also means about 50% of chance you're gonna see a loss. And, and you feel miserable. So we added these, these hokey little emojis here. So there the emoji looks like he's really sad or he's got to go to the bathroom really bad. <laughs> but if you can hold off and look at it once a month, the odds of seeing a gain go up. But still, at, at two thirds, you, you feel kind of balanced there. You're not feeling really great about a phenomenal portfolio. So if you can hold off and look at it once a quarter, the odds of seeing a gain go up and hey, you know, he's starting to cheese it up a little bit. He looks really happy. And then if you look at it once a year, okay, huge likelihood that you're gonna see a gain, you know, and he's got this 100 watt smile. Now, when we developed this, I honestly thought this was a little, well, not, not a little, like way too hokey. <laughs> like People aren't gonna use this thing. I was dead wrong. This is easily the most popular tool that we've created. And I know, I know people aren't going to look at their statements just once a year, but this literally shows you the dangers of looking at it constantly, checking it every hour. So try not to do that. Try to stay focused on the long term and know that if you do look at it in the short term, it shouldn't trigger excuse me, yet another bias, the action bias. We always tend to feel good when we do something. And often with investing, the best course of action is to take no action. And again, that is so, so hard day to day when your brain, that system one is screaming, you know, do something, buy this, sell this. You know, so hopefully that, that wheel of investor emotion can, can take away some of the, the, the emotion that's involved in decision-making and, and keep us focused on, on the long haul. Yeah, the thing that I that I use uh, with with clients and those clients that are out there listening, you probably heard this uh, many times before. Uh, in 2000 to 2002, 2007 uh, uh, to 2009, uh, March, April of this year, when markets come down, the human emotion feels like people they, they got to do something. I, I you know I, I I can't take it anymore. It's emotion. I can't take it anymore. I got I got to do something, and I kind of equate it. And a lot of times, doing nothing is the right thing to do. But it just feels it fe emotion. It feels doesn't feel right, and it's kind of like you're walking in the streets in Manhattan, in the dark alley, and someone jumps out up up out at you, or or you see someone in the shadows, and you feel like. It's fight or flight, right? You got to, you're gonna fight them, or you're gonna fly, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna run away, right. and just kind of standing there and doing nothing is is uncomfortable. 
but that could be, just be someone walking by. You know, they're not, they're not harm, harm, looking to harm you. Yeah. So, and, and that's that's a great example because, and, and again, tying it back to the media, what we perceive as a threat is really important. So again, a, a short-term decline in the market is not really a threat to your long-term wealth, but it may feel that way. It may feel like you know th this guy jumping out of an alley. And you know, to extend that analogy, maybe it's a guy jumping out of an alley because he's running across the street. You know, he, he's not jumping out to, to mug you. But in that moment, it, it, again, it's so hard to figure out what's a credible threat. Do I need to act on something? Should I not do anything? Now, the, the institute that I manage, we've got an advisory board that consists of institutional plan sponsors, uh, academics, consultants around the world. One of them, David Iverson, co-head of asset allocation from the New Zealand Super Fund. He's got this great thing with his team and they've got like a sheet of paper of actions that they could take after they discuss an investment decision. You know, we're gonna buy more, we're gonna sell this, we're gonna pair, we're gonna rebalance. One of the things, one of the action items they literally put on the list is a box and next to it, it says, take no action. So this, this kind of clicks a, a, a mental switch in our head if we do, do something like click that box, but just having that as an option when you're discussing an investment decision can be really helpful. Like, yeah, we did something, we took no action, you know, on to the next item. Now, I would be remiss if I did not talk about the election, uh, being that it's election day. Um, what's your thoughts on, on election from an emotional standpoint? I, again, I, I, I think it's a, a short-term event for long-term investors. And if, if there is you know, a, a Republican uh, White House, Republican Congress, that may be one may may mean one thing for investing. If it's if it flips the other way, and you know, Democrat in, in the White House, Democrats control Congress, it may mean something else. But again, th those are largely short-term events. I, I think the president is like the quarterback of a football team, gets more credit when the team is doing well, gets an unfair amount of blame when the team, the country is doing poorly. Economically, I think that the Fed has more influence on what the markets are doing than the president in the long term. So again, this is a highly charged election and a lot of the biases that we've been talking about, whether it's extrapolation, confirmation bias, the media, you know, where we get our, our information is, is feeding this. But I hope, I hope people can look at the result as, again, a, a, a short term I don't want to say blip, it's going to be more than a blip, but a short-term event for long-term investors. And and just kind of a follow-up, I know kind of you answered it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, should there be any kind of social or political upheaval, um, you know, based on what's going on today, maybe over the next few weeks, if we don't find out who the winner is? Right. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's a possibility. It, it, it certainly is. And going back four years ago, I, I, I think the election results are surprised so many people. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if there were some social unrest, maybe even some violence, unfortunately, because of the how emotional folks are about both candidates. But again, I, I hope the vast majority of Americans can stay calm and, and stay focused on the long term. And honestly, I, I view both parties in this two party system as needing the other. You know, the Republicans may say they hate the Democrats and, and Democrats hate the Republicans, but in a two party system, they need each other. So I, I hope we can keep those things in mind as we move forward and move forward, you know, hopefully together as, as, as a country. That is a great message. I really appreciate that. Bob, is there any question that I didn't ask that I should have asked? Anything else that uh, you wanna? Uh... No, we, we, we touched on a lot. I, I guess we, we, we kind of hit on the importance of, of an investment process. 
you know, that, that can really be a, a great way to stay focused on the long term and, and maybe plot out in advance what you would do during a market crisis. So we, we developed this other tool, this investor stress management plan. So again, write down what you would do during a crisis ahead of time. And, and one of the things that we put on there, and we developed this with a, a psychologist, was have an outlet for your emotional reaction that has nothing to do with investing. And now that I think about it, I kind of did this when I was grieving. So you might want to plan a vacation, make a favorite meal for your kids or your grandkids, um, do some things around the house, watch a favorite movie. So when you have that emotion, you can channel it into something that you can control and makes you feel good. Do those things for a few days, a week, and then come back and look at your portfolio. And then again, kind of like David Iverson at New Zealand Superfund, have a list of things that you're going to do. I'm going to rebalance. I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to reassess my risk. And you know, I encourage people to, to continue to work with you in following that plan. If we plan out this stuff ahead of time and we can pull it out of a drawer and say, okay, this is, we talked about this. This is what we need to do. We're far less likely to, to, to succumb to some of those biases that, that I talked about and make poor decisions. We, we definitely don't want to do that. So it sounds like the key is to have a process and to have a plan and stick by that plan through yes. emotional things and good and, and bad. Well, yeah. Bob, you said it all. You did great. I, I thank you uh, and we all thank you so much uh, uh, for that uh, as we go through a what will be a uh, emotional day and possibly uh, longer. Um, for those of you uh, that uh, like Coffee with Crav, we do this um, the first Tuesday of every month at 10 a.m. Eastern time. The next Coffee with Crav will be December 1st. We will have Gary Sherman. Uh, Gary right now is living on a, uh, with heart disease and recently uh, received a left ventricle assist device that is attached to his heart and helps pump blood through his body. We're gonna talk about that. But also Dr. Sherman is a team supervisor for New York State Contact Tracing. So we'll get the inside scoop on how things are being contained here in New York uh, with COVID-19 and why places get uh, closed down. So once again, join us next week, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. We will see you then. Bob, thanks a lot. Take Bye -bye. care, everybody have a great, uh, great day.